even though I feel great, I think I look okay, my wife tells me that I look great. Um, you know, turning 40, it still makes you wonder about a lot of things, and I certainly am not unique to that, so I'm glad that you're here to help answer a lot of these questions that we have from the exam rubies who are right there with me wondering the same kinds of things. So um, I want to start just by asking you, how much more difficult is it to maintain good health after 40? Does the body really start working against you once you hit that age? No, it definitely doesn't. 40 is a number. Uh, 40 is something that we feel nervous about when we're 16, because it means we're definitely grown up. But I gotta tell you something, Chuck. Adolescence doesn't really end until about 47. So right now, you're still basically a teenager biologically, if I can put it that way. Um, the, the body does slow down, but not really at that age. Um, 40 is still a time when people are vibrant and healthy and not really that distinguishable from their 18-year-old selves. And uh, Mike is, he was all over this. He's like, all right, I want to make sure that I feel my best for as long as possible. He's wondering whether he should be taking supplements now that he's hit the big 4 Well, you should be taking supplements at any age, um, but very, very, very limited. And we've talked about them on this program before. And the number one is B12. Uh, you do need B12. I don't care if you are a nursing baby um, or you are a person of 40 or 85. Okay. B12 is something you need for healthy <laughs> nerves. And the thing about B12 is it's not made by animals, it's not made by plants, it's made by bacteria. And the only reason that it's in meat is because there are bacteria in the cow's gut, but many people don't absorb it well from that source. So you really ought to be taking a B12 supplement. Vitamin D comes from the sun. If you're not in the sun, maybe a vitamin D supplement. But that doesn't have anything to do with whether you are on the north or south side of age 40. All right, let's jump over to the big one that's on a lot of people's mind, and that is weight. A lot of us, when we step on that scale, we look down, we see that number, and it's a lot higher than it used to be. Uh, Mia is wondering, why are we more likely to gain weight after 40? Well, if you look at kids in schools these days, they're starting to gain weight at 14, or even before that. So it's, it's really a progression, and your average American gains roughly maybe a pound and a half per year, something like that, with a lot of variability. But that, if that's an average, what that means is between 30 and 40, you might gain 15 pounds. But it's not because you're 40. Between 40 and 50, that's gonna happen again, and it might have happened before that. But, but something can happen. And, and that's, not only are we eating, say, fatty foods like meat or cheese that have a lot of calories in them, but those fats also get into your muscle cells. They get into your liver cells, little tiny particles of fat that get into the cells. Your mitochondria are in the cells. Those are little furnaces that burn calories. As the years go by, as fat gets in there, it stops the mitochondria from, from being able to burn, uh, burn calories so effectively. So at 40, what's happening is just the accumulated damage to your cells that's going to now slow down your metabolism. But that's reversible. It's reversible by doing a diet that has no animal products, so no animal fat, keep oily foods really low, and the mitochondria can come out of that oil slick and start burning calories again, like they did when you were a teenager. All right, so <laughs> the other thing about growing up, turning 40, is you're a full-blown adult. And with being an adult, you have these responsibilities, and with these responsibilities, for a lot of us comes a lot of stress, right? We have a full plate, and I'm not just talking about what's for dinner. Uh, Harper is wondering how much stress might contribute to weight gain. Uh, the stress itself doesn't, um, but how we handle that stress is the big thing. And it can go exactly two different directions. One way, sometimes stressed out people stop eating. They're too stressed. They, uh, they don't sleep well. They don't eat much. Uh, both things can happen. And as this rolls along, it can roll right into depression. The other approach, though, is I'm stressed. Now I'm going to eat more. And for many people, that's really I good. eat less. Um, it's April 14th. Stressed. I'm an accountant. I, I'm under so much stress. And this is not my time to, I work out to take care of myself. And so the they're smoking more. They're eating more. And I feel better. Other things can, can really run into trouble. So it's really a question of not the stress causes cortisol or your bloodstream to cause you to gain weight. Not really. It's more how you respond to the stress. What's the answer? 
The answer is to go to the store and have a lot of healthy foods in your cupboard at your desk so that when you feel like eating something that's not so hot, there's an apple there for you, or a banana, or a pear, or a melon, or something like that, so that your stress eating happens to be healthy. All right, let's talk about uh, exercise here a little bit. I've been sitting on this particular email for a while. A gentleman by the name of Elvin wrote in, and he explained how he had just come in from um, playing a pickup basketball game with his kid and, uh, and his son's friends, and uh, he was like, man, I am gassed. And so he's like, why does it feel so much harder to exercise after 40? It's really uh, maybe two things. One is, yep. as we've discussed, if we're gaining more weight, um, we're going to be it's harder to move the body around. Um, also, if we've been less and less active, let's face it, teenagers are often very physically active and with the responsibilities of work or parenting, we're less active and so our joints and our muscles aren't really used to it. But you can work, uh, you can get it back. So there's no reason why a 40 or 50 or 60 a person should slow down at all. You've had uh, Dr. Jim Loomis on this program who ran an uh, uh, Iron Man Apple to celebrate his 60th birthday. Um, so there's, there's no reason to, to be slowing down at all. And by the way, at the uh, ICNN, we have a conference for nutrition and medicine. Our first speaker, Brian Carlson, talked about his journey over time and how uh, after he had gone vegan, he was uh, in fact much more, uh, his, his running times were much better than they had been when he was uh, in his 20s. So he's now a couple of decades later, but he could be better. In, in my own life, that's the case. I'm quite, quite a bit yeah, stronger. Yeah, uh, I'm stronger now that I'm vegan too. Than I did when I was uh, in the uh, okay, so now that's a little bit of breaking news. I don't think uh, we knew that you, you ran track. This is interesting. Okay, okay, I see you, good content. Um, let's take a question from uh, Dawn here. Oh boy, this is a good one. Uh, Dawn is wondering how difficult it might be to reverse the four decades of damage that she's done to her health. She's ready to make some changes, but is it too late? Oh, it's absolutely not too late. Um, everything can change. We talked about your fat layer. Let's say a person has gained weight and they think, I've had it, I've got to do something. The very day that you throw the animal products out and keep the oily, greasy stuff low to do them both, the weight loss is going to begin. And a couple things happen. One is because you're now eating high fiber foods, you're going to fill up sooner. So you're going to actually be eating less, even though you think it's the same. That starts burning the weight up. The fat's coming out of your muscle cells, coming out of your liver cells. That means your mitochondria are going to rub up. And they are going to be able to burn calories faster, especially in the afternoon period. And third, all that fiber from beans, whole grains, fruits and vegetables has a special effect. It goes down your digestive tract with all the other things you've eaten. That fiber traps some of the calories that you've eaten. They keep going down your intestinal tract. They never get absorbed, and you literally flush those calories away. So what am I saying? You're taming your appetite. You're trapping calories and flushing them away. You're boosting your metabolism. All of these things can happen. I don't care if you're 40, 50, 60, 70. This can happen. Your arteries can clean out, or that process can start, regardless of age. That's the work that Dr. Dean Arnish showed us, and you can feel a lot better. So no, the, the fact that you may be the far side of 40 doesn't mean that these things can't reverse. Your body's got healing powers, and uh, you can put them to work. Let's talk about the realistic expectations. I mean, let's be honest. We have heard some of the most incredible transformation stories on this show. I've interviewed so many people who have dramatically improved their health. I mean, take uh, just from ICNM a couple of weekends ago, uh, Dr. Daniel Ganu coming all the way from Africa after having rheumatoid arthritis for 20 years, could finally, you know, get on that plane, could lift up a piece of paper. That's how bad that he had gotten. That's a pretty extreme example of a health transformation, but Vic, Dr. Barnard, is wondering, what is a realistic expectation in terms of being able to improve somebody's health, um, given the fact that they, again, may have done a lot of damage over the years? Well, it, it really depends on what the organ system is we're looking at. Fat can go down, as we've said. Uh, the arteries can start to clean out. And, and by the way, even if they don't clean out um, all the way within the first month, two months, three months, Dr. Dean Ornish has quoted this 
physics principle that we may remember, which is that blood flow through the artery is a function of the fourth power of the radius. What that means is a little bit of widening out means a big increase in blood flow. That means oxygen going to the heart, going to the brain. And that will start right away within the first week or two of changing your diet. And so somebody says, I've got chest pain, I've got angina, I'm done for, I'm 55. Stop. Make these changes. And for most people, their chest pain will be gone in four, five, six weeks. This doesn't mean canceling your doctor's appointment, but it does mean that the diet is going to help you to get much better. Um, your joints um, have paid a price. Uh, if you've damaged them permanently, um, let's say you have rheumatoid arthritis and, and you haven't been able to treat it appropriately with diet or medicines and so forth, that joint damage is not going to go away. They're not going to clean themselves up and stop further damage at that point. Cognitive function, you start to see in some people, starting about age 45, uh, they are not cognitively as sharp as they were when they were 15. Uh, there's a lot of variability about when that starts, but researchers have shown that that too, in the early stages, can be altered once a person is on a healthy diet. To some extent, the, those early cognitive changes can be worse too. Those early changes, is that necessarily indicative that a person is developing dementia or Alzheimer's, or is that just kind of like a natural part of aging? I don't know if I call it a natural part of aging. Uh, different people are at different Alzheimer's risk, and it's in, in great part genetic. There's this APOE epsilon 4 allele. If you got it from both parents, your risk of Alzheimer's is much higher than otherwise. Even in those people, we have seen that diet changes can uh, either delay or greatly slow both. Uh, this mild cognitive impairment where you're just having trouble remembering names and that kind of thing. And probably also delay or prevent Alzheimer's disease. Probably not for everybody, but for uh, almost certainly the great majority of people. The reason I say that, there was a huge Scandinavian study that looked at people, um, followed their diets starting at age 50. And what we found is that those people who even had the genes that I described, if they followed a diet that they're going to call healthy, and healthy that means without the high saturated fat foods, the cheese, the dairy, uh, dairy products, meat, uh, their risk of developing mild cognitive impairment was cut by about 80%. So if you can stop old age memory problems by simple diet changes, so that's a great thing, and that's, that's what the science seems to say. So here's a conversation that we've bantied about the dinner table uh, here is like, you know, both my wife and I are horrible with names and have been virtually our entire life. So if somebody has always been forgetful with names since they were basically a teenager, I mean, is that any reason to concern? Does that mean that there is that elevated risk there? Is that just kind of the way the person's life? That's the way the person's wired. That's a sign that both of you are so creative. You're thinking about other things all the time, and you just didn't have time to remember that person's name. Oh, man, I'm going to sleep better tonight. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, OK, so we talked about the foods that contribute to uh, potential cognitive decline. Now let's talk about the healthier options that are more likely to stave that off. Take the question from uh, Jordan here. What are the best foods to improve your memory? OK, all right. Um, Let's go into the bad and the good list. Um, the things that you want to avoid. Uh, the Chicago Health and Aging Project is a classic study. Um, back in, it was 2003, they came out with this landmark report that said saturated fat's a baddie. Saturated fat is strongly uh, associated with increased Alzheimer's risk. What are the sources? Dairy, number one, meat, number two. And let's add coconut oil and palm oil to that list. They got saturated fat. They are mismarketed as health foods. You should avoid them. Okay, that's the bad stuff. Trans fats also bad, but they're mostly out of the, out of the market now. They're not really used in, in uh, manufacturing, although there are traces of trans fats in animal products because the animal's body made them. Uh, the other thing is to, to avoid uh, getting too much iron and too much copper. That's, uh, say, cast iron pans. Hey, baby. Yeah. Copper pipes. Take the music down. Uh, or taking supplements. That I don't want to get flagged. Copper when you didn't need them. That's, those are the bad things. The good things. Uh, vegetables and fruits in general are associated with uh, sustained good cognition. For some reason, people who eat a lot of vegetables and fruits are cognitively about 11 years younger Yay. than people who avoid those foods at whatever calendar age they might be. Uh, specific foods, the blueberries, um, uh, grapes, even red wine, 
They have anthocyanins, that's what gives them that purple color. And researchers at the University of Cincinnati showed that people who eat a lot of anthocyanins have better recall, uh, better long-term memory as well. This is not a reason to drink red wine because the alcohol itself over time is gonna probably have the opposite effect, but it's a good reason to put blueberries on your salad. Uh, vitamin E is a good one. Vitamin E is little bits in green vegetables, mangoes, sweet potatoes, lots of it in seeds and nuts. Uh, and if you have maybe about, I, I don't like to overdo it with nuts and seeds because they're so fatty, but say an ounce a day, that's the amount that can go into the palm of your hand with, without hitting your fingers. That will give you maybe five or so uh, milligrams of uh, vitamin E. That's good. Um, exercise, aside from diet, lace up your speakers. 40 minutes, a uh, good brisk walk three times a week was shown at the University of Illinois to help reverse the brain shrinkage and also to preserve memory. So there you go. You know, and, and those nuts and seeds, one of the things that I like to do to help control those portions is just kind of use them as a salad topper. So just as you said, put a little bit in the palm of your hand and sprinkle it around. You get that little bit of crunch with your greens. Ah, bag of teeth, my friend. Um, we were talking about heart health a little bit earlier. Madeline has a follow-up question. Uh, how much higher is the risk of heart disease after somebody turns 40 years old? It goes up uh, with age. Um, and it's the final event for about half of us. Um, but the reason it goes up, it's not because of the calendar, it's because of cholesterol. Um, as our bodies, well, our, our bodies have to respond to what's happening in our diet. And if our diet has animal products in it, as mine did when I was growing up in North Dakota, uh, the cholesterol in those products and the cholesterol that your body makes in response to eating the saturated fat in them, that, those cholesterol particles irritate the artery wall. And as time goes on, it gets more and more irritated. And you'll grow atherosclerotic plaques. The minute you stop eating those foods, no matter what age you are, that process starts to reverse. So the only reason that we see more of it at 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 is simply that there's been longer time for that damage to occur. But as, as, as Dr. Ornish's elegant research has shown, and Dr. Esselstyn similarly, um, what we see is that when people change their diet, regardless of age, those plaques can start to reverse. All right, now this is a great question uh, and the perfect name for it too. Bubba. Bubba sent in this question, uh, wondering whether lean meats can still contribute to heart disease. We hear it so often when we're talking about red meat, hamburger, steak, things like that. But what about white chicken, white turkey, things like that? Yeah, they're misnamed. Uh, they're not really that lean, and yes, they'll contribute to heart disease. And let's say you go to the store, Best and time. you pick um, lean beef, or better still, you're going to pick get chicken. Best and you're going to throw away all the dark meat and take the skin off it. You're going to think there can't be any fat left. Stop. Don't put it in your mouth. Send it to a laboratory, and they're going to give you the bad news. 23% of its calories come from fat. Um, and about a third of the fat is plain old saturated fat that's going to raise your cholesterol. Uh, plus, the chicken doesn't have any of what you need. It doesn't have the fiber that you need to take cholesterol out of your body. So when people switch from a meaty diet to a diet that is more lean meat, more poultry, more fish, their risk of heart disease can go down a little bit, but it doesn't really go down dramatically. Um, one of the studies that really the, the famous PREDIMED study, where they wanted to look at Mediterranean diets. So stop eating butter, use olive oil instead. Stop eating so much red meat, have fish, have chicken. And they were able to reduce, well, they didn't reduce cardiac deaths at all. They didn't re reduce total mortality, mortality at all. What they did is do is they were able to cut into stroke uh, a bit. But the bottom line was, it wasn't that effective to go to the leaner meat or the poultry or the fish. What was effective in that trial they did a sub-analysis of those people who on their own went more plant-based. And the more plant-based they were, like completely vegan, um, their risk of dying of a heart attack, dying of anything, was cut dramatically. So, so lean meat, I understand why people are going there because that's what marketing has said. It doesn't work very well, unfortunately. And that, that risk you were talking about, I'm assuming that came regardless of any sort of genetics that they may have, any sort of family history? Yeah, you got it. Uh, the Predimate trial that I was describing was huge. It was more than 7,000 participants. 
They were followed for almost five years. It was the best science that we do. But the intervention they were testing was just so weak that at the end of the trial, you really couldn't see. I, I'm not saying it was useless, but you, you, it, it's, to use an analogy, the person doesn't want to get lung cancer. Should you cut down on smoking? Uh-uh. You got to quit. There is cutting down gets you a little ways, but quitting really gets you where you want to go. Gotcha. Um, going back to those expectations here, Sarah says, uh, look, you know, I, I'm adopting a, a completely plant-based diet, whole food plant-based. Uh, how much benefit might I expect to see in terms of reversing heart disease, even if it's not fully reversed? Is that, that's a hard one, yeah. isn't it? Uh, this, this was really uh, quite a striking thing. When, when Dean Ornish did his research, um, I mean, his back in 1990, I think that's when the world set up the notice because that was the year that The Lancet published the Lifestyle Heart Trial results. And as that data was going on, hadn't yet been published, I, I called him up on the phone, and I hadn't met him before, and I said, you know, I'll bet that people will believe that this works, but people will also think it's too hard that nobody could follow your, your regimen. People don't want to go vegetarian and so forth. So he invited me out to California to meet all of the participants. And it was so eye-opening in response to this question. The people in that study were from a wide variety of ages. And the study was still ongoing. But even within the first month or six weeks of beginning, it was a diet and lifestyle change. Throw out the animal products, take a half hour walk every day, try to reduce stress, don't smoke. That was it. They didn't use statins. They didn't use any cholesterol lowering medications. And what they found is that the heart uh, pain, the chest pain, was gone in about a month in virtually everyone. Um, and what that means is that the arteries are opening up again and age had nothing to do with it. So it's a, in other words, if you're 75, 85, do the same diet, it's gonna help. Uh, so we're talking about heart disease. Uh, I think that we can't have this conversation also without talking about high blood pressure. Katya has got an interesting question. I mean, given the fact that so many of us, Dr. Barnard, now have high blood pressure, she's wondering, you know, what makes it so dangerous? Uh, several things. Um, high blood pressure means that in your arteries, the pressure in there is, is too high and that, first of all, irritates the artery wall. Your artery wall is really tender. It's one cell in width that's, that's um, the, the, the inner layer of the artery. If you put too much pressure on it, it can get damaged. And that leads to, that accelerates the narrowing of the arteries, <coughs> the aspects of carotid plaques, all it gets worse. You got arteries going up to your brain. These are carotid arteries. They need to get blood flow through. And as they narrow, that reduces the blood flow. It increases a place where clots can form. It increases the ability of uh, breakages in the arteries to cause a hemorrhagic stroke. We don't want that to happen. Lower down, uh, you've got your kidneys. The kidneys are trying to filter the blood, and if you turn up the pressure there, that's going to wear them out, wear them out fast. Uh, you see people who are on dialysis, that's you know, probably nine times out of ten, either due to high blood pressure, diabetes, or both. You don't want that. And in between the brain and the kidneys, what do you got? You got your heart. And if your heart has to deal with too much pressure in the coronary artery, the artery blockages form there too. And that means that one day, one of those little blockages looks like a little blister in the wall of the coronary artery. It breaks open. When it breaks open, a clot suddenly forms that shuts off the blood flow to a part of the heart muscle, and that's a myocardial infarction, a heart attack. So you can turn down your blood pressure, and you can start it today with some fairly straightforward diet changes. Yeah, and Perry is wondering whether uh, of those dietary changes, taking uh, salt off of the table, taking a lot of that out of the diet, is that the most important step that somebody can take for reducing their blood pressure? Uh, not the most important, but it's the first step. Um, and it's, it's the thing that doctors always say, uh, is stop using so much salt. And people will do that, and I gotta say, they sometimes complain about that because, because I gotta tell you, your, your, your food will taste much different on a low salt diet. If you stick with it, your tastes will accommodate, you'll, you'll adapt, and that's good. The net effect of that is not huge. It will knock several points off your blood pressure, but not 20 points. So let's do two more things. Um, in addition to reducing sodium, oh, oh by the way, um, when you're reducing sodium, reduce it mostly in the salt that's in the foods as you're preparing them. The amount you might use at the table is trivial compared to the amount that's often in foods when you're when they're being prepared. 
or the amount that's in them intrinsically. If you get some cheese, Velveeta, it's got a huge amount of salt inside. Velveeta's got much, much more, or all cheeses have much more salt than, say, table cheese. So that hidden salt is worse. The amount you're adding at the table is, that's the tip of the iceberg. That's not, that's such a big deal. Um, but when you go on a completely plant-based diet, your blood viscosity goes down. That means the thickness of your blood goes down. That's great, because if your blood is more like water and less like grease, your heart doesn't have to push so hard for it to flow. Your blood pressure comes down much more then. The third thing that happens, not only are you avoiding sodium or reducing sodium and reducing your blood viscosity, this plant-based diet means your weight comes down. And when you have lost 20 pounds, 40 pounds, 200 pounds, your heart doesn't have to work nearly so hard and your blood pressure is going to go down. And so you talk to your doctor and your doctor's got you on blood pressure medicines now, be in touch with your doctor to taper those off as your blood pressure comes down. And that way you won't uh, end up being um, hypotensive where your blood pressure is too low. Well, now, Polly's got a good point, though. We're talking about uh, pre-prepared foods, and we all know that they have a lot of salt in them. I assume that of the plant-based options that are in the frozen food aisle, no exception to that. Polly's wondering whether those uh, vegan burgers and vegan meals can also contribute to high blood pressure. Depends on what's in them. Uh, look at the label. The sodium content is part of it, but not the most important part. The, the, the biggie really is the fat content, especially saturated fat. Think about this. When I was a kid, growing up in Fargo, I'd wake up in the morning to the smell of bacon. My mother would be cooking bacon for her five kids. And after she took the bacon out of the pan, I, I don't know if your mom did this, but she'd take a fork and pull the bacon out and put it on a paper towel to cool down. The bacon grease would then go into a jar yes. where my mother would want to save it. And that jar just went on the shelf. She didn't refrigerate it. Because as it cools down, that bacon grease turns into a solid, kind of waxy fat. Let's say you decide I'm gonna get um, an impossible burger. I passed up the Boca burger or the other kind. I got the impossible burger because it's supposed to be so um, meaty. It gets that way because I put coconut fat in it. That coconut fat is just like the bacon grease. It's really high in saturated fat. When that goes into your bloodstream, it's like putting wax into your bloodstream and your heart has trouble pushing it so your blood pressure goes up. So, are veggie burgers bad? No, they're fine. They're much better than the meat burger. But read the labels. And the Impossible Burger was not designed for you. It was designed to seduce meat eaters into realizing that a vegan diet is okay. But for a person who's already on a plant-based diet, choose the ones that are really low in fat and where the saturated fat content is, is more or less zero. That will help your blood pressure not go up, it will come down. I think your mom and my grandma would have gotten along famously uh, with, and they would have bonded over the jar of bacon grease. I mean, it sat right on top of the stove. Didn't matter what grandma was making. I'm telling, and I've told this story many times on the show. She would take a spoon and put it with whatever it is that she's making. That bacon grease was in everything right down to her morning coffee, man. Um, <laughs> you are kidding. I, 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 I mean, I hope I am. Uh, I mean, I was pretty uh, good. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, but, but you know, that's, that is something we all grew Some up with. Some people put fat in their coffee. It makes it taste good. That's sick. But you know, that is an entirely They're Killing themselves. Thing. If you didn't grow up with it, you don't want it. And <laughs> once a person breaks that habit, they don't want it green beans or rice flavored with, with that grease. But you, you, you want to not have it. But you know, our parents grew up with that and they passed those tastes along, unfortunately, to the next generation. Yeah, I mean, no joking. That absolutely went in the can of green beans that she would open up. Um, is green beans, boom, right. and then a big old scoop of that. Uh, okay, uh, you know what we haven't talked about much here on the history of the show is kidney stones. And uh, we actually have quite a few questions about that. Um, Joel is wondering how common kidney stones might be for somebody who's over 40. Yeah, they are common, and, and you'll, you'll see it starting really in the 30s. You know, when a person hits 40, it's, it's more common. It, it does happen, and, and they're caused by a mixture of things. Um, most of the stones, if a person has surgery and the stones go to the lab, they'll say calcium and oxalate, and some of them are uric acid. But, but yeah, you see them in the 30s and 40s and beyond. 
Uh, so you're talking oxalates. Uh, Edgar, wondering, can eating too much leafy green vegetables cause kidney stones? Now this, I believe that we did touch on. There was some celebrity that was eating two tubs of spinach a day and, and ran into some issues. So can you talk about uh, leafy green vegetables and the risk of kidney stones? Yeah, uh, leafy greens do have oxalates in them, but for the most part, they're not an issue. For, for the most part, it's not a, not a big deal. Um, those oxalates can sometimes precipitate out even for their, their meat and soy. Um, the, the real thing, the, the important things for avoiding kidney stones, number one, it goes right along with body weight. So everything that reduces weight is good. Um, you already know that animal products are part of the issue, and all the kidney organizations, advocacy organizations, talk about Animal protein, part of the problem. Plant protein, fine. Um, the third thing is, and you know this already, but being hydrated. What The reason a stone is there, a stone is like a crystal. And the calcium and so forth in your blood is now actually just turning into a solid crystal in your kidney. And if we're really hydrated, meaning more water pouring through, that helps reduce the risk. So, but does it matter though what you're drinking? You just mentioned water. Juanita's wondering whether soda and other kind of sugary drinks can actually cause kidney stones. I don't know if they're part of the cause, but they, they are certainly correlated with it. I wasn't ever sure if that was the soda was causing it or if the soda was with the cheeseburger and the cheeseburger, no, seriously, and the cheeseburger is causing. We've seen a lot of this. We've seen uh, sodas are associated with diabetes, but it's not so much the soda that is doing it, because when you parse it out, sugar doesn't seem to actually cause the diabetes. It's all the stuff that you're eating with that soda that, that's really the problem. And that may be the case for the uh, for stones, too. That said, you know, sodas are not a food. It's not a bad idea to get away from. So type 2 diabetes, you just mentioned diabetes. Type 2 diabetes used to be referred to as adult onset diabetes, but we're seeing that with younger and younger and younger patients, unfortunately. Theo, though, wondering whether that risk actually increases even more once you hit the big 4 -0. Yeah, it does. In, in fact, we used to say, um, this sounds really creepy, but uh, there was a thing that doctors used to say, I used to tell patients, they would say fat female in 40, uh, meaning that when, when you're at that age, that's when the di diabetes risk gets that's higher, or if you're overweight. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it is more common at 40. However, so it's not caused by age, it's caused by fat, building up inside your muscle and liver cells that's starting the insulin resistance. Let me say that one more time, because people can't get it out of their head. They think that somehow potatoes or sugar or bread or carbohydrates in general cause diabetes. Not true. Diabetes, type 2 diabetes, starts as insulin resistance. That starts as fat building up inside your muscle cells and your liver cells so they don't respond to your insulin anymore. And if you've got diabetes, getting that fat out of your cells will improve it or make it go away. And it doesn't matter if you're 40 or 14. You can go into any school in the United States and a lot of the rest of the world, and those kids already have the beginnings of insulin resistance because they're eating chicken wings and cheese pizza and fried junk that's causing these changes in their bodies. They're not going to get diabetes for another 20 years, but the process is started. And uh, we're actually going to have Cyrus Kambata from Mastering Diabetes on the next live Q&A. So if you have questions related to diabetes, type 1 or type 2, he's the guy to ask. So join us next Wednesday here live, noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. And uh, be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel so you get that nice little reminder. Um, here's an interesting one, too, uh, Dr. Barnard. Uh, this, this may be new territory for the exam room as well. Um, you know, the glasses... They just tend to get thicker as we get older. And so Elijah is wondering whether uh, a healthy plant-based diet can actually help to maintain eyesight uh, and eye health overall. That is a good question. Um, it, yes, there, there are different things that can threaten your eyesight. Um, let, let's get into the diabetes discussion first before we go to some other things. Diabetes is one of the biggest threats to eyesight. Person with type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes goes to the doctor, the doctor looks at your retinas, and they are looking at these most delicate little blood vessels that can be damaged, and you can see the damage on the eye exam. So, so this is one of the biggest reasons why you want the diabetes to get under control. Run, do not walk to a completely plant-based diet to protect your eyes. Okay, so that's number one. 
Um, number two, just about everybody has even a little whiff of a card, uh, cataract. That's the lens on, in the front of the eye. So we're talking about the retina, the back of the eye, and diabetes. The front of the eye is your lens, and little parts of it will opacify. And starting at 40, you can see a little trace of it, over the 50, over the 60, over the 70, the doctor says, well, some of that's just normal for your age. Researchers have found something kind of surprising. Uh, people who avoid dairy, people who avoid milk, cheese, and so forth, are at less risk of cataract. Now, it's not the only contributor. Um, ultraviolet light, you know, if you're a professional golfer, the ultraviolet light can, ha can hammer your, your uh, uh, lenses too. So taking steps to protect from UVB is a good idea. However, people who eat more dairy products are at higher risk. Why is that? What we think it is in this case is not the fat. It's not the estradiol. What we think it is is the dairy sugar. The dairy sugar lactose breaks down in your digestive tract, assuming you can digest it, to release the lactose, which will go right into the lens and park here. And that's part of the problem. So avoiding dairy is an issue. Maybe the last thing is macular degeneration. Back at the retina, right around the, the macula, which is where you've got your, your most focused vision, uh, that will start to go bad for some. And that can be devastating, where you just lose vision, uh, particularly central vision. We've known for probably 20 years that people who eat abundant vegetables, especially dark green vegetables, can reduce their risk of it. It's because of, of carotenoids that are in those vegetables. So yeah, can the diet help? Getting away from the bad stuff, the dairy, the high fat foods that increase body weight, increase insulin resistance. Nice job. Do that. We're and not. make those vegetables part of your routine. There's every, they help Stretch you in so many ways. They've got calcium, they got iron, they got traces of omega-3, and they've got the things that protect your eyes too. All right, a couple of more topics I want to hit on that are big for, uh, for those over 40 now. Um, and bone health, I think that this is one that we need to talk about. Uh, Jim is wondering, what is the average age for somebody when their bones start to weaken a little bit? You can see it in just about any age. Um, for many women, uh, menopause is oh, perfect timing, baby. That. So that's what I'm thinking. Um, and these hormone-related changes do affect our bones, uh, but that doesn't mean that they can be It's quite a lot of use. And how strong are the bones of people who eat a plant-based diet versus those who are eating the um, oh, diet? There's yeah. always just the finished back cooking and in the instant pot. I'm just curious to get you to weigh in on this. Breakfast time. Well, um, the bones can be weaker, they can be stronger. It's all, frankly, the difference between a vegan diet and a vegan diet is all about the fact you're not having dairy. For typical omnivores, they figure dairy is going to get calcium. If you're not having dairy, you can get your calcium from something else. You need the vegetable feed. So let's say you're not doing any of that, and your calcium is low. It doesn't matter what you diet is, if your calcium is low. Um, by low, I mean below about maybe 600 grams a day. 